our granddad was a furnace bricklayer and then our dad was a furnace bricklayer and he had quite a good job. He actually worked for one of the biggest companies in the UK that did furnace linings and he was the North of England contract manager for them. And he had an argument with his boss over something and said, right, I'm leaving. And it was on sociable hours, so people would still ring him up and he said, well, I've left. And they said, well, we, we work with you. So he set his own company up. He really struggled. He had two partners at the beginning. They got into debt quite early. The other two partners pulled out and he took the debt on for their shares. Which when you weigh up that I was six years old and my brothers were 14, 15 and 16, and he left a pretty good job to do that. It was either, well, stupid, brave, bit of everything. But he did it. I don't think I could have done it. Not with having four, four kids at home. All the stories, we lived off my mum's teaching wage for 10 or 15 years. It was really a struggle and uh, getting it going and uh, really struggle to get business. There wasn't a lot of work knocking about in the, in the 70s and 80s. All the nationalised industries were closing down. And in Warrington, where our base is, our original base, we, uh, there was three steel plants that we did work in. And it was basically my dad and two or three other blokes. And then my brother Paul, um, he sent Paul away to do an apprenticeship with another company. When I left school when I was 17, I got an apprenticeship in Scunthorpe for a big American company in refractories. So I spent four years over in Scunthorpe and then I came back to work for my dad. Like Simon said before, I was earning big money. Just come out of my time, started earning big money. And then he asked me to come back straight there. It's your dad. Simon came along a couple of years after I got back. He came under my wing. I've always said, you know, after working for your older brother, doing an apprenticeship in the steel industry, because we work seven days a week, 12 hours a day. If you can do that for four years, you can do anything. And we, we were doing bigger and bigger jobs, but then, as usual, when you work for your older brother as an apprentice, you're always going to be his apprentice. I left the company for four or five years, and I went working in the Middle East and that's when I found myself more on the business side, working for some of the bigger companies. And what got me working for the bigger companies made me realise that they had professional managers running their companies, not people who actually knew how to do the work. I ended up having to hire me dad and me brother and other people from TAB to come and help me. And eventually Paul just said, this is stupid. You know, you're getting all this work. Why don't you come back to the family business? I looked at the workforce we had and I, I'm like, you've got a brilliant workforce. But the company didn't make any money. We're the best company out there. There's no one to, you, the, no one's got the workforce that you've trained, Paul. And after a year, I was getting very frustrated. We weren't making any money. We were on rubbish wages. And a good company's got to make money to invest in, in its future. One night, I remember me and Paul met in our local pub, but I'd had enough. And I just said, look, I'm gonna call it, I, I can't stay. And he said, what's the problem? And I said, we got this great workforce, but we, we don't price enough for the service we provide. We're bringing all this quality. And he said, what would you do? And I just said, we need to, go international, we need, we need to grow our profile, we need to take bigger jobs on, we need to make money. We need to pay our people more, they're better than everyone else. He said, so how can we do that? I said, I'd need to run the company. And he basically said, I've been waiting a year for you to make that decision. And I think that was where we really turned a corner. When your older brother who's eight years older than you that trained you, basically said, you be the boss. And we just did a deal there and then in the pub over at Pine, he said, you go and get the work, and I'll build it. One of the things that became very evident when I took over the company, the customers realized that I'd put the prices up. We said, look, we don't want to be judging on our upfront cost. Give us one furnace. Let us line that furnace up front, putting the best linings in with the best installation people. And then we measure that furnace over five or six years. Unplanned downtime, maintenance costs, tons of aluminium produced through that furnace. And then let's work out a cost of aluminium per ton produced through our furnace. Then measure us on that. And it was before there's a thing called TCO, total cost of ownership, which is a, a, a buzzword now in business, but we sort of developed that about 30 years ago. And it's the total cost of owning that furnace for the customer over its lifetime. So up front, there's a bigger cost with us. But over the life of that furnace, we've been audited by every major aluminum producer in the world and we're the cheapest. Once we got started getting the references, the proof was in the pudding. We bring value to our customers. All of us at TAB have built furnaces. None of us are professional managers. We're tradespeople. A long time ago, uh, me and one of my other colleagues what, uh, used to work here. 
we were doing a block paving job in Wollstone there in Warrington and the uh, director of the company, Mr Paul Tabraham, come round one day and he said, do you fancy doing uh, two weeks work at Latchford Novellis? So we went there and here we go, 30 years later and I'm still here. Tab has been a massive part of my life since the day I was born. Um, just very excited to be part of the success story, uh, seeing us grow into all regions of the world and especially now in the USA also. I think a big part of our success is also that we're always looking to improve, um, willing to try new things, open to new ideas. And although Simon is the MD, he's not dictatorial and there's definitely a leadership committee where our views and ideas are welcomed and I think that's a great part of the success. We saw where furnace linings were failing and a lot of companies, well great, furnace lining fails, it's extra money. You go in, you repair it, it fails again, you go in and repair it, it pays the bills. We got sick of getting phone calls at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night or a Sunday night, we've had a failure, can you come and repair it? Our attitude was, how can we solve this problem? So we found that by doing things, common sense things that a trademan knows that an, a, an engineer might not understand, we were like, well, that fails because we're doing this and we're putting that joint there. We're not using this material. We're not putting enough expansion in. So we just started tweaking little things that made all the difference. Things stopped failing. And I remember one of our first customers at Latchford Locks in Warrington said, you're doing yourself out of business. You're solving all these problems. And off the back of solving those problems, we were getting good references. And that's where we're getting all the new business. And it's something we still say to this day when we go into a new plant, people think, you line furnaces. Everyone lines furnaces. We've had a company do, re, doing our repairs for 20 years. So I said, well, that's the difference. We'd have solved the problem in 20 years. We've been using TAB now since 2015 and uh, almost exclusively since about 2020. And they have revolutionized the way that we have approached our linings. We've gotten a lot better life, a lot more reliability. I think early on our team was skeptical that TAB was going to be able to differentiate themselves in a market with entrenched competition. Clearly they were wrong. TAB has been able to dislodge many of these competitors by focusing on two things, speed and quality. The customers that use TAB, they understand their cost structure, the overall value of furnace uptime, uh, maintenance cost, and longevity. TAB's a great example of how a company can be so impactful by delivering tangible results that resonate with customers. I had experience and contacts in the Middle East that had developed uh, with American engineering companies and with some of the aluminium producers in the Middle East. Then our really big break came with Rio Tinto, which in the, at that time was the biggest mining company in the world. And they had these aluminium smelters in South Africa. They wanted to reline 10 furnaces, which is a massive contract. South Africa has a very entrenched furnace lining industry with all their steel works, all their aluminium, you know, platinum mines. I didn't think I really had a chance. And then the more I got talking to them and what we found in general, people had just been doing the same thing over and over for 20, 30 years. No one was moving the game. I looked at their linings and their furnace linings were lasting four or five years and they were losing a lot of production, a lot of downtime and having to reline them. And I did some audits of their furnaces and said, look, we can double your lifetime and increase your capacity by 25% for the same price. And at the time it was a massive project and we managed to win that project. We did the first furnaces and it was the first time anyone had ever increased capacity of these furnace linings and guaranteed double the life and guaranteed there would be no extra uh, fuel consumption to create this remelt, a digital remelt. It worked. We believed in it and it happened. And off the back of that, Tab went massive. But the whole project was 10 furnished relines with millions of dollars and the whole project paid for itself in six months with the increased capacity we gave them for no extra fuel consumption. So it met environmental emissions, were reduced per cost of aluminium per tonne produced. It cost them nothing. It paid for itself within its own financial year. So off the back of that, all of a sudden, we set up in South Africa, set up in Australia, Brazil, New Zealand, you know, Bahrain, Dubai. And it, all that happened within three or four years, we just went stratus stratospheric. That's when we met our first real struggle because as you get bigger, cash flow is, is your problem as we were getting bigger and bigger and then also training enough people to meet the growth we had. Me and my brother, just we were on the road. We both had young families and we were on the road nine, ten months of the year. 
by now, most of the companies that are in the global aluminium industry grew as the aluminium industry grew. Aluminium now is the metal. It's the modern metal. It can be recycled cheaply. Uh, it doesn't erode. It's the metal of the future. So aluminium has, has boomed in the last 20, 30 years. So we were playing catch up. I was actually living in Australia. I'd moved to Australia to set the business up in Australia and New Zealand. And we got a phone call from a company called Pyrotech. And Pyrotech um, basically did everything servicing the global aluminium industry except furnace linings. It's still owned by one man called Alan Roy, an Australian. Two or three people wrote to me and they thought that Pyrotech should buy TAB because it would get us into a new area. I didn't think it would fit. It was contract work. It was something that we hadn't done. Three or four of our people who I really valued wrote back to me and said, Alan, you are wrong. This would really fit well. I wasn't convinced they were right, but I said, maybe you're right, and I would like to talk to TAB. We went out the next night, didn't we, for a, a going away? Well, I know. think what it came down to... There I'll, you go, see. I'll, I'll, I'll just feed you. <laughs> I think Pyrotech's big, big concern was they were buying people. And Pyrotech had always been an engineering company and pro providing precision parts for the aluminium production industry. Uh, our field is people orientated. Let's say negotiations were tough. I was, I was ready to walk. I, I, we didn't need to do the deal, I didn't feel. And in the end, we went out with, uh, with Don Ting, who is the CEO of the company. That night, we, we broke down some barriers. The next day, it was the first time that Paul said, I want to do this. There wouldn't have been a company for me to come back to if Paul hadn't had stayed there and come back after he finished his apprenticeship. And it's the one thing Paul wanted to do. And I think once he said that, I was, OK, let's do it. Pyrotech and TAB joining forces is one of the greatest synergies in our history. Uh, TAB has uh, excelled in the space of furnaces and uh, Pyrotech, that's a totally new area, totally new market for us. We knew nothing about it. And TAB joining Pyrotech, well, Pyrotech brought together its uh, uh, global locations and presence. And essentially, uh, I think we helped accelerate TAB's growth exponentially. Um, both things were so mutually beneficial that it's hard to create a better marriage. And uh, what was terrific was that uh, by growing TAB, we were allowed to go into markets that they weren't in before. For instance, TAB, uh, TAB sales now over 50% are in the United States where they weren't uh, present before. So it's been a great partnership and looking forward to many, many years ahead. Pyrotech were the only company that said you carry on running it as if you still own it. And that made the difference. The big thing since we came part of Pyrotech is we've set global infrastructure up. It's still predominantly based on a lot of people from our hometown relocating to parts of the world in the USA. People we recruited in Australia are now running projects in the USA. We've also got a nucleus of USA young people that we've been able to mould in the traditional TAB way. There used to be a concern, what happens to TAB after me and Paul? I'm not concerned about that anymore. We've, we've built these, all the people and mirror images of what we wanted TAB to be, and we trust them. There's a feeling at TAB that we don't have to chase anyone. We all trust each other to do the job. And that's the, the family factor, I think, that we all bring into the company. We don't want to let each other down. And it's up to this next generation to train the next lot. And as we keep doing that, we'll keep being the best. TAB has a really special workforce. Um, these people have a supreme urgency about doing high quality work uh, and, and making sure that the customer is taken care of in any situation whether that's uh, 2 a.m. on a weekend or an emergency over Christmas Eve, uh, TAB people are willing and able to step in and take care of the customers. And our customers really appreciate that. Um, I've often thought in, during crises, when I'm in the trenches, I want people in the trenches with me that we can rely on. And that is totally TAB. Everybody at TAB who's made it through our apprenticeship scheme basically has passed through Paul's standards. 
and his standards are ridiculous. Everybody at TAB has that mentality. If we don't do it to the best we can do it, we don't do it. And if we, if we can't guarantee a customer we can't do it, we'll walk away from a job. And it comes to a situation now where the customer will say, when can you do the job then? But we want this team. They say, we will fit our window when we can have the best TAB team. If we aim for perfection, we might catch excellence. We just try and do the best we can. And you can't do any more than that.